Hello and welcome to our session on evidence-based public health and its linkages to dissemination and implementation science. I'm Ross Brownson and I work at Washington University in St. Louis. In this brief module, we're going to cover three objectives. We're going to talk first about the basic concepts and some of the value around evidence-based decision-making in a public health setting. We'll talk about an application in public health practice, uh, one that's particularly based on strong evidence, and then we'll talk briefly about some areas of overlap between evidence-based public health and dissemination and implementation science. If you think about the big picture for public health, I think this diagram is very helpful. You want to look over on the left-hand side that organizations are made up of individuals. So if you picture a state or local public health department, you want to have individuals who are highly skilled at their practice in evidence-based uh, characteristics. On the right-hand side, you've got the organization. The organization facilitates the development of individuals, and individuals help to shape organizations. Those work together to develop the, the overall setting for evidence-based decision-making. And then the outer context here, we see the funding environment, and we see the political environment, as well as many other important contextual variables. If you see where DNI science comes in, it often focuses largely on the organization. While individual skills are important, the organization is often the intermediary or the conduit between an evidence-based practice and the improvement of health in a population. So it's important to keep that in mind. If you think about the word evidence and what the word evidence really means, it can come in a lot of different forms. It can be a systematic review, uh, a synthesis of literature. It can be a scientific article that report, reports on a single study in a journal article. It can include data, quantitative data in a surveillance system. It might include program evaluation data that's both quantitative and qualitative. It might include a range of different qualitative data from community members, other stakeholders like policymakers or practitioners. It might involve someone's professional judgment who's working in a public health setting. It might include data collected in the private sector through media or marketing. It might be word of mouth. And it might be one person's personal experience. All those are forms of evidence. Near the top of the hierarchy are more objective forms of evidence, and near the bottom are more subjective forms of evidence. If you know that saying that beauty's in the eye of the beholder, that holds just as well for evidence. If you're trying to communicate with a policymaker, a good story might carry the day just as much as a systematic review. If you're talking to another researcher or a public health practitioner, you're probably focusing on things that occur more toward the top of the hierarchy here. Another way to think about this is sort of a Venn diagram of evidence domains. If you think about breast cancer mortality, for example, we have strong evidence in the upper circle that screening through mammography can reduce breast cancer mortality up to 30%. In the lower right, you need resources to be able to implement mammography screening at a population level. That might be the right people, it might be the right machines, it might involve professional standards to guide judgment. Over on the left-hand side, you might need to look at the, the needs assessment in a population, the values, the preferences, um, the ability for one population to prioritize one health issue over another. And then in the outer environment are the organizational and contextual issues. These are often uh, political issues. It might involve transportation. It might Im involve employment and where people get their health insurance. All those influence evidence-based decision-making, particularly around our example here of, of breast cancer mortality and, mortal and mammography screening. My favorite baseball movie is Field of Dreams. Um, this is the Field of Dreams. If you remember the saying from that movie, if you build it, they will come. Um, I think that's too often how we've thought about evidence-based interventions in public health. If we have a new finding, we have something that should be applied, people will magically do it. And that's just not how it usually happens. Passive dissemination often doesn't work that well. Evidence hierarchies are important to think about as you plan your DNI study or apply DNI principles in practice. 
Here's a traditional research hierarchy that tends to privilege randomized controlled trials near the top and more single case studies near the bottom. These, this hierarchy has been developed primarily for clinical interventions based on, on clinical trials and epidemiologic designs. What's really important for public health and what's different, you see the middle here about quasi-experimental studies that might be used for um, learning about policy experiments. And you see at the bottom, the foundation of this being stakeholder and consumer uh, perspectives, that we wanna get information from the audience and from the people who might be affected by an intervention. That's really the foundation for public health in many ways. Let me give you a quick example of the application of a few of these principles in public health practice. Some of you may be familiar with, with tobacco and tobacco control very well. We've known since the middle of the last century uh, that smoking is linked to various diseases, uh, starting especially with the 1964 Surgeon General's report that, that first linked smoking in a definitive way to lung cancer. California in 1988, in a landmark public health endeavor, uh, passed a price increase for tobacco and earmarked those funds for tobacco control with a strong media component. Amazingly, within about a five-year period, we saw a doubling of the rate of decline of smoking rates in California. And I'm gonna quickly flip you through a couple of maps that shows how things happened over time in California. The red are high smoking rates and the green are low smoking rates. You see data from 1990. We look into 1996. We go to 1999, and then we see by 2002, we have all green with a little bit of yellow down in Riverside County in Southern California. And then if we go to more recent data from 2014, uh, 2012 to 2014, we see that the entire state is, is lower. Um, in fact, now the overall smoking rate in California is 11%, the lowest in the country, and the highest smoking rates are now in the north. And so you can see the value and the, the really the power of a public health endeavor like California Prop 99. What's important is that it's been translated to other states. It's been applied in Massachusetts. It's been applied in Oregon, Arizona, Florida. It's been used by CDC to develop best practices. And it is now clear that tobacco control policy has a big impact on tobacco use. But if we had relied on randomized designs as we would in clinical research, we wouldn't know much at all about policy interventions like tobacco control. I'd like to also remind people that public health is a team sport. This says it's time we face reality, my friends. We're not exactly rocket scientists. I think about this as knowing what we don't know and working in other disciplines. If you're going to work in obesity prevention, it might be important to work in the public health sector but it might be even more important to work in transportation or city planning or, um, or um, uh, schools or other settings that are outside of the traditional health sector. So it's always important to keep that in mind. And so I'll wrap up with a, a few key characteristics that I think summarizes a lot of what I talked about here. In public health and in, in, in DNI science, we wanna make decisions based on the best available quantitative and qualitative research. We want to apply program planning frameworks. You'll hear in other uh, modules about a variety of DNI models and frameworks. These often have a foundation in theory. We want to involve stakeholders. We want to decide who's important in making a decision all the way from the bottom up and involve them in planning a program, planning a study, implementing it, and evaluating it. We want to recognize the roles of leaders and organizations which is fundamental to DNI science. And then we want to work with practitioners to design interventions for DNI in a topic we call designing for dissemination. And so if you think about the context, the context for evidence-based public health, if we apply five principles here, they, they not only make public health stronger and more effective, but they also inform DNI science in meaningful ways. So I want to thank you for your attention today. And here's my email if anyone has follow-up questions or comments.